All right, well, thank you very much. We've got such a great start, and we'll continue now with a visual aid in the presentation of Anne Marie Adams, who is William C. McDonald Professor and Director of McGill's School of Architecture. She is the author of four groundbreaking books and a work on a project delightfully titled, titled Death Comes to the Hospital, uh, which explores the spaces of healing and dying in the late 19th century and early 20th century hospital. Her work pushes the boundaries of traditional architectural research by approaching the history of medicine through architecture and questions of gender, and more broadly exploring how we read complex buildings. So should I turn the light off? Yes. Yes. Okay, well. being 
modeled on an artist studio to something closer to a scientific lab. PhD education in architecture is not so obvious. When I came to McGill in 1990, as a relatively young prof, I was one of three professors with a PhD. Now we have seven, which is over 50%. We have 12 profs. Most schools in architecture have zero professors or one with a PhD. So when I went to school, this is how we all wanted to learn how to draw. This is one of my most precious objects in my personal life, a drawing by Princeton-based Michael Graves, who was the hottest architect in the 1980s. Uh, and he did this drawing for me at the USSR border in um, 1985, as you can see at the, at the border in 1985. And anyway, we all copied his way of drawing. And this was the ultimate. Now this is how students draw. It is a world away from what I learned how to do uh, in a single generation. Now here's the point I'm trying to make. This is what an award-winning master's thesis in architecture looks like. It is not a 100-page uh, typed document that goes into the library. Um, and here are three projects from last year. Um, New Shigeli, who's great there behind me, uh, did a pro the project on the left, which proposes a new um, design of new settlements to address the rising water levels in American Samoa. The middle project, Francis King, dealt with the closure of churches in Montreal and proposed all of the precious artifacts and archives be moved into a single church. And on the third, Don Taramanoff proposed a, literally a kind of hovering airport in the St. Lawrence uh, for Montreal. So for master's students in architecture, they must articulate their arguments in the form of design rather than in the form of words. Now, if a student can make an argument in words, I tell them about a building, it helps them to do the opposite, to make an argument in architecture about words. That is, the value of the humanities in architectural education will thereby lead to a more powerful built environment where, where we make buildings about ideas. Here is here is the matrix, the one page thing that I live by as the director of a school of architecture. This is set by the Canadian Architectural Certification Board. It lists 31 so-called SPCs, oh it's so hard to read, along the uh, left, the vertical axis. SPCs are student performance criteria. Along the top axis are the courses we offer at the school, and the squares are where we hit where the, where the students learn the skills required to become an architect. So you can see that some courses have zero boxes. Those are the ones, the courses that are likely to not be given much longer. And the red ones are the ones <coughs> that I colored yesterday to show you how much of it is humanities. It's roughly 25% that they curriculum, which you, depending on where you come from, may seem like a lot or not much at all. So, since the 1980s, roughly, schools are transitioning from being wholly about creating architects to now being about 50% creating architects and 50% creating architectural researchers. We have been the only PhD program in architecture in Canada, so that has really, really uh, pushed our emphasis on research. This is, I want to switch gears here. Um, I believe that places shape our lives, obviously, or I wouldn't be an architectural educator. This is where I study at UC Berkeley, a very tough building, but the big concrete one there, modeled on a warehouse. And the idea of the building was that architects learn about buildings and learn how to make them by inhabiting one that tells a story about itself. It's exactly the same kind of tradition as the Leacock building, which I believe many students in the humanities are programmed to hate, which is, um, I actually love the Leacock building. So all of these brutalist buildings, as they are called, are the architectural equivalent to swearing, profanities, or rock music. That is, they are provocative. Here are the two stair here are two stairways in my life. On the left, the stairway in Worcester Hall, where I went to school. On the right, the stairway in my school at McGill. Buildings shape us. 
Worcester Hall demanded that, that you as a user respond to it, and that's what the Leapfrog building does, even in a negative way. Generations of students decorated this famous stairway on the left. People from all over come to see this stairway. Our stairway on the right at the is a very different tradition. It, it associates with genteel met, um, gentlemen's clubs, aristocratic mansions, definitely not warehouses. It is about solitude and planned encounters, and it teaches students the tradition of buying materials. So the stairway on the left of Worcester Hall shaped my work because I study architectural resistance. That's what I look for in places. I study change. I, I study students who hate the Lee Hawk building, rather than the architects who intended the Lee Hawk building to be a particular way. So I search up sources like this one, which is a very non-traditional blueprint. Uh, most architectural historians look for beautiful, untouched images. I study them like this. This is the nurse's residence at the Royal Victoria Hospital with the writing of nurses' notes telling the architects that they should make the rooms bigger. So the timing is really too fast. Buildings tell us how we are expected to act. That's what I believe. And the buildings are particularly bossy towards women and children. So I searched out methods. I, in, in my own work, I searched out methods of women's history and the history of medicine as a way of populating architectural history. I teach undergraduates the history of architecture, not the history of architects. And that is a huge difference from other schools. I, as those of you who know me will know, I am absolutely obsessed with the Royal Victoria Hospital. I'm famous for never giving a lecture without showing it. And uh, my latest book on the right is all about the Royal Vic. I think my work has very much been shaped by the fact that I'm the only woman professor, I was the only woman professor in the School of Architecture for 22 years. When I came to McGill, I had uh, no idea that the world's biggest uh, hospital was about to be planned, which has really affected uh, my own research work. Um, architectural history, I think, naturally connects to the present in a way that rarely happens in history departments. And my new work, as Maggie said, is all about the spaces of death. You may recognize the dissection lab, the anatomy lab in the Strathcona building, um, and those are uh, human remains. The long ones are the um, full bodies, and the one close to us there is that human head that are brought together again every night, the bodies and the heads of the, um, the bodies and the heads that belong together are brought together uh, every night. So these are the kinds of spaces I'll be studying. I'm very interested in the visuality of uh, medical education. For this final part of the uh, talk, I'd like to switch gears again and show one slide each of eight of our PhD students in the school because I think the topics, their topics uncover unexpected meanings in particular building types, resistance like I study, um, but also I think it's very important to show how our three-person committee structure, PhD committees in the Faculty of Engineering, reaches out to many crops in the humanities at McGill who enhance the work of our PhD students. So here is the work of Julia Tischer, who works on German bunkers uh, uh, during World War II as places that empowered women so places that are usually understood in a very negative way or seen in a positive way. Olivier Valeron studies queer domestic space in the fine line between art and architecture. And the, the, uh, the third person on that committee is uh, Professor Amelia Jones. Frederick <coughs> Eiler studies modern doll, doll houses and gender expectations. Jackie Reed Walsh from education. Tanya Gutierrez Monroy tracks the experience of real women in three North American cities, Mexico, New York, and Montreal. Rafiko Ruiz studies the Grandfell Medical Missions of Newfoundland. And we're very happy to have Professor Darren Burney. I could not show that. Yeah, it was good fun. It was a good fun. And Susanna Havelka tells the untold story of the Canadian North how Inuit women have changed government-imposed housing. Heather Braden takes a material culture approach to Montreal bridges, 
with David Penstead, Mickey Ginsburg, and Sherry Olson on the committee. And Tanya Southcott studies the relation of photography and demolition in Montreal. She's just getting started on this and is connecting nicely with uh, high play. My last slide is the tile in the McDonald building, the one I started with. This is on the in, in the third floor, just outside the Dean's office, Dean of Engineering, Percy Knowles McDonald building. And I, it's one of my favorite uh, parts of the building, of course. It represents the eight original departments of engineering. The tile shows the architect's tools, the old ones, uh, resting on a beautiful classical balustrade against a lovely view. Perhaps, I imagine, looking out to the humanities. Thank you. Transformation from science to humanities student was a direct path 
this concern is one of the things that led to the humanities. I didn't see the sciences and humanities as addressing different topics necessarily. I saw them as taking different approaches. Um, while there is a space for error analysis in lab reports, my TAs at the time would most certainly not have been impressed if I had included in that section an essay on misconceptions in popular scientific discourse. <laughs> if we respect disciplinary boundaries, which is something I don't really like to do, but it's certainly a practical way of working. Um, so if we do respect disciplinary boundaries, then an essay on misconceptions in popular scientific discourse would not be a science essay, it would be a humanities essay. All this is not to say that I'm only interested in science-related questions from a humanities perspective. Um, in the most cliched sense, Tessa de Durberville's The Portrait of a Lady and The Stranger changed my life, and I encountered them prior to entering a science-focused study plan. Reading these novels gave me a sense that there was a lot going on that I just wasn't getting, even though I understood the plots perfectly well. They taught me to close read, and I found the process of close reading so exhilarating that I started to close read everything. My father would get exasperated when I puzzled over ambiguities in physics textbooks. And yet, on the other hand, um, my early English essays, many of my friends have noticed, were structured a lot like mathematical proofs. It was all about logical progression and type conclusions. My writing had no flair at all back then. It was about presenting my argument as simply as possible. Although my writing has changed somewhat since then, I was never very invested in working out a clear separation in the way I think about literature and the way I think about science. In fact, most of my work right now is interdisciplinary. I think the idea that science is everywhere is something that most of us are familiar with, um, from the thermodynamics underlying the principles of the engines in our cars to the reverse osmosis processes that are involved in most water filtration devices. As long as we know how to look, we can indeed see science everywhere. Something we hear less often, however, is that the humanities are also everywhere. I have a lot of good friends still in the sciences, and while I've been mostly lucky in that no one's been indelicate enough to ask me why I'm in the humanities, they frequently ask me what I do. Um, we got into this question a little bit last session when I noted that technically, I don't really understand what my engineering friends do either. Uh, but I understand that in some way, the kind of work some of them do might be responsible for my phone, perhaps. Some of them might be responsible for the bridges I walk or drive over. The point is that we can very easily see some of the results of their work in our day-to-day -day life. Similarly, most of us have some idea of what doctors do because we've seen them work. We also have some kind of idea of scientists and lab coats pouring mixtures together and watching them explode. <laughs> Certainly, none of these impressions are comprehensive, but they make us aware of the kinds of works that scientists might possibly do. The problem my friends frequently have um, is that they don't recognize what the product would be for the kind of work I do. A lot of the things we study in the humanities, like artifacts, historical documents, and books, for example, are very visible, but the actual work we do is frequently less so. How do I look when I'm working? Certainly not as striking as a scientist wearing goggles and a gigantic lab coat. What kind of thing is my master's research paper? It's probably not as tangible as, say, a new fungi-resistant variation of a plant species. And yet, my friends would be very mistaken in supposing that the humanities do not affect their day-to-day -day life quite as much as sciences do. Just because they don't recognize the way it affects them doesn't mean that it doesn't. What I try to do then when they ask me questions about my work is to try to help them recognize some ways humanities affect their lives. Sometimes I do this in general terms. So depending on who I'm talking to, I might put an emphasis on the kind of work we do in, say, gender studies or race studies. While internet message boards suggest that some people have serious misconceptions about this work, um, at least most people understand that being called a racist or a sexist is not a compliment. So most of us have come to this understanding because of the humanities, and I would argue not because of the sciences. Scientific writing tends often to make essentializing arguments based on gender or racial difference. True, scientific writing also makes arguments based on differences in size and in species and in climate. But the point here is that it is not scientific influence that is responsible for a general understanding when it comes to gender and sexuality, um, or the fact that sexism and racism are bad. Rather, historically, it has been in the humanities that these issues have been addressed. Other times, I will speak to the way my work affects their work more directly. When I talk about the problems of popular scientific discourse, a lot of my friends who remain in the sciences respond well to that. 
seems that many of them can be sometimes frustrated by the ways their work are misunderstood. Just a few weeks ago, I read articles on the discovery of a new Einstein manuscript that quote unquote reveals an alternative to the Big Bang theory. As a matter of course, I sent the news article to my dad, and he wrote back, quote, Einstein was very open-minded. He questioned the Big Bang theory on many occasions. It's not surprising that he would have written something like this, end quote. While his lack of enthusiasm was kind of disappointing to me, for whom the idea of a new manuscript is exciting enough, <coughs> um, he made a very good point. This doesn't actually reveal something we don't already know, or rather, does not reveal something that physicists don't already know. The rest of us don't know better, um, but how long before comments pop up on the internet forums refuting the Big Bang Theory because even Einstein didn't think it was true? Um, so when I talk about how I'm scrutinizing the way science writing imparts scientific knowledge, a lot of my friends understand in some way how my work begins to relate to theirs. In the end, they won't necessarily know my work any better than I know about the scientific underpinnings of multiple types of car engines. Um, but in the same way I'm aware that the car engine is an integral part of my life, they begin to see the importance of the humanity for theirs. So this leads me finally to my main point, um, humanities matter. I know that's the title of the session, and therefore not very original. Um, and yet I spend a lot of time thinking about this. My initial reaction as a humanities student when faced with this title was to ask myself, why do they matter? How do they matter? But then after a while, I started to look at the topic differently. If someone were to refute the assertion that humanities matter, this person would be suggesting that humanities do not matter. Because even to say that humanities sometimes matter, in some instances matter, or in some ways matter, is to acknowledge that they matter. So in a way, my task could be quite simple. I can argue that humanities matter, by showing that they don't not matter. In approaching the question this way, I acknowledge that I will, in my premise, be taking the assumption that science inherently matters and that usefulness is inherently good. And while I think these assumptions require a lot of scrutiny, I'm not treating them here as truth, but setting them up as useful structuring devices that I hope to undo along the way. But I think it is true that in popular discourse regarding whether humanities matter, they are contrasted with the more useful quote unquote scientists. So I will begin to work toward my argument by way of examples. I can start very simply um, with my phone. I love my phone. I can use it to call, send text messages, check my email, <coughs> surf the web. I'm sure it has many other functions that I don't even know about. Um, it's so useful. These functions are all part of the reason I chose this phone. But this is not the only phone that has these functions. So why did I choose this one specifically? A large factor for me was simply that I thought it was very good looking thin and sleek and just altogether very adorable. With all the different colors and new versions of these devices coming out all the time, I venture to guess that I'm not the only one who takes into consideration a phone's appearance. While we might weigh utility and beauty in different ways, such that we might not all agree on which one is better if we're faced with the choice of one that has poor functions but great looks, and another that has great functions and poor looks, but I imagine most of us would agree that the ideal phone will have both great functions and great looks. We're happy with the technological advances that allow our phones to do so many things, but the technological aesthetic also matters. Artistry is everywhere and is an immovable component of many of the most quote-unquote useful things that we have. In an economically driven society that favors items that will sell, an important factor in how well items sell depends on how they look. Returning again to the question of scientific and fictional writing, I would note that scientific communication in many ways relies on techniques of literary writing. Many of the literary critics working on evolutionary biology and literature, for example, have noted the influence of literary and religious works on scientific works of the 19th century. As someone who works mainly on 19th century literature myself, I have written on Abbott's novel, Flatland, which is a story about how a two-dimensional square discovers the third dimension. These types of narratives abounded in the 19th century, as people living in three dimensions analogically tried to envision what their fourth dimension would be like. Many mathematicians included such narratives in their mathematical writings. In other words, they made use of fiction to communicate mathematical knowledge. This has continued into the present day. My first linear algebra professor told his own version of a flatland narrative when he tried to explain higher dimensions to our class. Even physicists in their current research frequently begin by working in two dimensions. 
The imaginary geometries of flatland narratives help thinkers envision higher dimensions far more effectively than algebraic representations of these dimensions ever could. Advancement in scientific knowledge is great, but in order for it to make an impact, it must be communicable. The other important thing when it comes to thinking about the potential usefulness of science and technology is the question of value. Ideally, science and technology as forms of knowledge would be value neutral. Science is the pursuit of no why, and technology is the pursuit of no how. But in practice, they are definitely not value neutral. As soon as scientific knowledge or technological knowledge is put to use, they incur the question of value. But science and technology are not inherently equipped to deal with considerations of value. For that, we need the humanities. There are very well-known examples of when scientific knowledge and technology have been put to questionable uses. Theories of evolution were largely useful for eugenic practices. The manipulation of dream, gene transmission in an effort to preserve the quote-unquote good and eliminate the quote-unquote bad was a perversion of evolutionary theory. Whereas natural selection implies a sort of natural process whereby certain traits that are better adapted to natural and social situations survive over other less well-adapted traits. Eugenics is a process whereby a certain subset of humans determine what they believe to be the best traits and work to actively eliminate the worst ones. The science in this kind of argument is itself flawed because there's no telling whether these desirable traits are, will actually allow for the species to adapt to changing conditions. But most of us are probably familiar with eugenics in relation to genocide. There are serious ethical questions related to appropriations of scientific knowledge. And it is the humanities that are best equipped to deal with such questions because there is nothing value neutral about systematized murder. The impact of the humanities may not be as directly visible as the effects of implementation of scientific knowledge and technological knowledge, but it is at least as significant. If we manage to find a cure for cancer, for example, how will we deploy treatment? Will we all have equal access to treatment? These questions bring up issues of social policy, and social policy should be informed by the humanities. The humanities do not merely react to changes, but are very much involved in shaping developments. Another less hypothetical example would be the case of the Aral Sea, which is actually a saltwater lake. Um, for years, water from the rivers feeding into the Aral Sea have been diverted to cotton crops. That's great for cotton and for those of us who have been buying cotton. Uh, but what ended up happening was that the water level decreased so dramatically that the salt concentration rose so high that most life could no longer be sustained. The area around the Aral Sea, which had depended largely on its fishing industry, <coughs> barely has any fish left. So diverting the water was a great idea economically, but what about the people living near the Aral Sea? To think about scientific and technological advancement and its economic benefits without considering their larger social and cultural impacts is irresponsible and frankly unsustainable. So humanities matter because I'm fairly certain that there is no situation in which they do not matter. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. A good reminder of why I'm so glad you moved from biochemistry. <laughs>